Good evening, good morning, wherever you may be in this great, big, beautiful world of ours. Thank you for joining us on the best in overnight talk radio. This is Coast to Coast AM. Sitting in for George Nori, I'm Dave Schrader. George is out in Salt Lake City, and he'd like you to join him at the Jeannie Wagner Theater. You can enjoy watching George Nori interview ancient technology expert Jason Martell, UFO investigator and journalist Nick Pope, and the man who died three times and lived to talk about it, Daniel Brinkley. George Nori will sing you a few songs with a live band, and you can take part in a Q&A with each guest. Don't miss out. There are still a few tickets that are available. You can call their box office at 801-355-2787. That's 801-355-2787. Or visit arts or artsaltlake.org. That's artsaltlake.org. And get your tickets to see George Nori along with his great guests, Jason Martell, Daniel Brinkley, and Nick Pope tomorrow. We start off the show with some sad news. Uh, We're going to Yountville, California, where three workers for a program that treats veterans for post-traumatic stress disorder were found dead Friday along with the suspect who took them hostage at the largest veterans' home in the U.S., officials have said. The four bodies were discovered nearly eight hours after the gunman slipped into an employee going away party in a building where combat veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan received treatment, said California Highway Patrol Assistant Chief Chris Childs. The three female victims were employees of the nonprofit organization Pathway Home Treatment Program, which is housed on the campus of the Veterans Home of California, Yountville. Childs has said it was far too early to say if they were chosen at random because investigators had not yet determined a motive. Although authorities called the workers hostages throughout the day, It's unclear just exactly how long they were alive and held by the gunman. The only shots that were actually heard at the center happened at around 10.30 a.m. when authorities say the suspect arrived. Throughout the day, authorities said they had been unable to make contact with the gunman. The bodies were found at 6 p.m. Our thoughts and prayers go out to the families of those women and the people involved in this case. John Sulston, a Nobel Prize-winning British scientist who helped decode the human genome, has died. He was 75 years old. The Welcome Sanger Institute, the successor to the Cutting Edge Genomic Research Center he once founded and directed, confirmed Friday that Sulston had died but did not say when or give the cause of death. Sulston shared the prize in 2002 for his contribution to work unraveling how genes control cell division. He traced the adult nematode worm C. elegans to decipher how cells divide and create something new. Findings, the Sanger Institute said, were key to understanding how cancers develop. He will be missed. Now imagine it's the dead of night. You're fast asleep. Suddenly, you're wide awake but unable to move. Hunched over you in the shadows is an eight-foot-tall, gaunt entity with spider-thin limbs, dressed in an old-style black suit, its pale face missing eyes, nose, ears, and a mouth. You finally manage to cry out, and the monstrous being disappears as suddenly as it appeared. You've just had a terrifying encounter with the Slender Man. Who or what is the Slender Man. We know that his existence began on the internet, but it hasn't stayed that way. Joining us next, Nick Redfern, right here on Coast to Coast AM. Nick Redfern is my guest for the first two hours this evening. We'll open up phone lines a little later on next hour if you have questions or your own stories regarding the Slender Man. Nick Redfern is the author of more than 40 books on UFOs, aliens, Bigfoot, lake monsters, the abominable snowman, Hollywood scandals, and immortality of the gods, weapons of the gods, bloodlines of the gods. He's appeared on many TV shows, including the Travel Channel's Mysteries of the Outdoors and the BBC's Out of This World, Sci-Fi Channel's Proof Positive, and more. And he's back as a regular contributor here on Coast to Coast AM, Nick Redfern. Nick, thanks for joining us. Hey, Dave. How's it going? It's going well. Thank you for Good. being on the show with us. Uh, Slender Man, this is something. Man, they've, they've got a new movie coming out. 
There's been countless video games. Uh, they've made this character an Easter egg in regular video games. He's shown up in some of the modern warfare and Call of Duty games in the background slinking around. This creature, this being, has become something explosive in no time. Can you give us a little background for listeners that are unfamiliar with this being? Uh, what's kind of the genesis point for him? Well, it basically began in the summer of 2009, June 2009, where a website, uh, Something Awful, had a contest, basically, to um, see who could come up with the creepiest creature for the Internet. And um, a number of people submitted uh, photographs and artwork and sort of Photoshop pictures of uh, you know, strange creatures inserted into regular situations. And one of the people who did this was a guy named Eric Knudsen. And Eric Knudsen is the guy who created the Slender Man and created the image of this tall, spidery type human being. For, at least it looks <laughs> superficially like a human being. A black suit, a black tie, white shirt, very long arms uh, right down to the knees, and these tentacle like, uh, octopus like tentacles coming out of its back. And. So in other words, it looks very creepy, and on top of that, its face is completely faceless. No eyes, no nose, no mouth, no ears, just sort of vague imprints where they should be. And of all the various submissions that were made to this contest, um, the Slender Man, created by Eric Knudsen, was the one that really got everybody's attention. And literally within days, um, it became arguably a, you know, a full-blown phenomenon. In the, from the perspective of people started blogging about it, uh, there were forums created in no time at all, chat rooms, uh, Wikipedia pages. There was also a very popular online um, series called Marble Hornets, which was kind of like a found footage fictional um, show that went on for, for a lot, very long time and um, had a huge um, audience. And so it, it really began to take off massively, almost immediately. And you had literally thousands and thousands of kids, teenagers, um, fixating and obsessing on the Slender Man and creating their own artwork and uploading it and creating backstories for the Slender Man as well. And, and, it, and it has really become, um, you know, as you said, it's here, there and everywhere. Um, movies, TV shows, um, you name it, um, even songs about the Slender Man as well. So it's, it has really sort of gone literally through the roof, you know, in terms of, of coverage and popularity. One of the things I find interesting about this, it came to our attention just around the same time the Black Eyed Kids phenomena mm. seemed to be on the rise. And I, I've always thought children, uh, spooky children like that are, are even more impactful and certainly We've had a good run on our show, uh, Beyond the Darkness, talking, as you know, about black-eyed kids and, and what's going on with that phenomena. But Slender Man has taken on a totally different, I don't know, more kind of an epic arc in the way that people are responding to it. What do you think yeah, the difference right is that. between that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, you're right. And it's not just in the U.S., you know, where it was created. It's actually all around the world. Um, and it has really become a global uh, phenomenon. I mean, if you just type Slender Man um, into, into Google, um, there are 7 million results, um, you know, which is, which is pretty impressive going for, you know, a fictional character. Um, and so in that sense, you know, we don't see things like this happen too often. Now, you're right, with the black-eyed children, that did start off, in a similar way, you know, sort of um, these creepy entities with the black eyes and, you know, people say, well, is it real or is it an urban legend? Um, and it, it certainly hasn't attained the same level of um, popularity and coverage that the Slender Man has, but there are parallels for sure, you know, in terms of the, the development and the escalating nature of the phenomenon. Well, Slender Man took on, maybe it was because of the eerie aspects of what Slender Man's story was doing in the real world, 
right? Black eyed kids, and, and not saying that the black eyed kids and some of these other beings aren't in the real world, but the black eyed kids always remain these kind of stories of of encounters with mm. these mythical human, maybe alien hybrids that wanted access or entrance into your home. There was really no concrete evidence of what would happen once they got in. Uh, for the few people that we've heard from, they ended up getting in, but the people got out, so they never had a final confrontation with these beings. But in the case of Slender Man, it took on a, a different, more sinister tone because people started adapting their lives. Unlike the black-eyed kids who were affecting the people, the people are being affected by Slender Man and acting out in his name or in his honor, if I can use that to, term loosely, because people began attacking other people, parents, friends, relatives, uh, in yeah, in trying right. to appease him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is where things began to change, Dave. Basically, it, it did begin. Excuse me, it did begin as a, a legitimate contest, um, and and it was intended just as a bit of you know sort of scary, spooky entertainment. But several months or so after the the phenomenon, if you like, took off, there was this unforeseen aspect where, as you said, people claimed to, that they'd seen the Slender Man in the real world, you know, not in um, forums, not in, um, you know, images on the Internet, but literally in the real world. And that's sort of where it got uh, my attention more than it did previously. I mean, I was aware of the Slender Man phenomenon when it kicked off in 2009 because it, it, it was big news on the Internet. But it wasn't until, as I said, a few months later that I sort of really stood up and took notice when, you know, the, the, stri- the Slender Man had gone essentially from being a fictional entity to a supernatural entity. And the overriding theory uh, as to how and why this has happened is the, the theory of what are known as tulpas in Tibetan terms, or a thought form. And for people who don't know what thought forms are, basically it's the idea if you have... It can be one person, ten people, but it's arguably better if it's an audience of hundreds of thousands, which certainly the Slender Man has. It's the idea that the collective mindset and imagination of hundreds of thousands of people who are perhaps, as I said, fixated and obsessed with the Slender Man, drawing pictures of him, uploading them, chatting about him, dreaming about him, nightmares, and this is going on all around the world. The theory is that this collective mind, hive mind almost, can bring to life a sort of supernatural equivalent of a fictional entity. In other words, the power of the human mind gives birth in a very strange and supernatural fashion to a monster. Now, it's interesting, Nick, and I didn't know this until reading your book, but I'm in your book regarding one of these strange synchronicities on this show, Coast to Coast AM, that I hosted with uh, my guest Bill Murphy talking about tulpas, discussing Slender Man as part of that scenario. And uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong, th- that episode that I did a number of years ago was the day before the attacks that took place in Wisconsin? Yeah, but basically what it was, <coughs> what it was, Dave, was that um, the attack... Um, by two girls in Waukesha, Wisconsin, uh, on one of their former friends. Um, the attack occurred on the morning of May the 31st, 2014. And the, well, the, depending on which time zone you're in, the attack actually occurred on the same day as the show. You know, the show went on into the early hours of the 31st, and the attack um, occurred on the 31st and of course as you mentioned you know on the show itself you're talking about the the top of the thought form angle and how you know life can be given to something that actually never really did live in the first place so and one of the other weird things is that one of the people i interviewed about that particular story um a woman who was listening to the show the next day, a paranormal researcher uh, named Alison Jornlin. When I interviewed um, Alison for my, for my new book, the, the Slender Man Mysteries, she pointed out to me that I'd actually phoned her to arrange the interview on the third anniversary of the stabbing, which was like a really weird coincidence as well, you know, of all the times I could have phoned, 
phoned her up. It happened to be the third anniversary. For for listeners that are not familiar with it, with the last few minutes here before we go to break, talk to us about the case that took place in Wisconsin. Can you give us some of the backgrounds and, mm. and intricacies of it? Well, yeah, this is sort of, you know, the, the ultimate dark side of the Slender Man phenomenon. What we had were two young girls who lived in a, in a city in um, Wisconsin called Waukesha, which is a suburb of Milwaukee. And basically what happened was that on the morning of May the 31st, 2014, um, the two girls who were involved in the attack lured one of their former friends, former best friend, um, to a nearby park in the city and um, took her to a, a wooded area. And one of the two girls proceeded to stab her no less than 19 times. And, and it's amazing and almost like a miracle that she didn't die because some of the wounds came sort of extremely close to organs and major arteries, etc. So, you know, it was really just, um, um, as I said, almost like a miracle that she survived. But essentially, the girls attacked the other girl um, in their own words because they felt that by sacrificing her that they would become in their words, the Slender Man's proxy. And so, in other words, it was, it was essentially like a sacrificial act. And after stabbing the girl, the other two headed off, they fled the area, and their plan was to go to a, an area of forest um, where they believed the Slender Man lived in this creepy old mansion. Now, of course, the police caught up with her quickly. Um, emergency services were... Uh, on the scene quickly and fortunately the girl made a good recovery both psychologically and physically and she you know she, she's okay now and as we heard just a couple of weeks ago the uh, the two girls um you know they're now um out of society for the next um 30 40 years you know it's going to be a long long time before they get out but those two girls you know that this they didn't do this in the name of the slender man as a means to you know get us insanity plea they really fully did believe in the existence of the slender man and you know that from, from their perspective at least you know what they were doing was, was was something that had to be done um but you know it was a case of the the uh, the lines between fiction fact reality and unreality were blurred in just about the worst worst way possible and what that case did was to sort of bring the existence of the Slender Man and the story of it to an even bigger audience. You know, when you've got mainstream news like, you know, Fox News and MSNBC, etc., um, you know, covering it, um, it, it went, it was elevated even further, but for, but not for a good reason. You know, it it was such a, a brutal story, and the idea that these girls believed they were going to gain the favor of an imaginary being. And it would let them in. You know, I mean, is there any kind of protocol or any kind of uh, sense that that this is something? I mean, is this like a, a mass hallucination phenomena? How how do we start to even rectify mm. that kind of logic for so many people? Because unfortunately, this was not an isolated incident. Within no, time wasn't. around that, there were other attacks that were being perpetrated by people trying to kill loved ones to gain favor with Slenderman. Yeah, you're right, Dave. And, um, I mean, you can look at it from several perspectives. One is the idea that it's sort of purely, you know, uh, an issue of the human mind where people are obsessing about it and, you know, they start to, as I said, blur the lines between reality and fiction and they, to the point where they cannot, you know, distinguish between the two. And, you know, there are a lot of people who, take the view that that's exactly what happened with the two girls you know that um that they they just they just totally believed in the phenomenon of the slender man bought into it and as i said you know in in a terrible way now on the other side of the coin you know you have people who take the view that there's more of a, a supernatural aspect to this um whether the you know, the, the, the thought form angle, um, people point out that one of the girls claimed that she'd actually seen something very much like the Slender Man years earlier. In fact, before, specifically before, Eric Knudsen had created the Slender Man. 
Well, that's a good point. Let's stop there, because when we come back, I want to talk about this archetype. A lot of people believe that we have that Genesis point in 2009 where it made its first appearance to the world, but there are different iterations of this character that have predated the Slender Man character. We'll discuss that with our guest, Nick Redfern, when we return on Coast to Coast AM. We're back. This is Coast to Coast AM. My guest for the remainder of this hour and next hour, Nick Redfern, and we'll open up phone calls next hour if you have questions for our guest. Uh, You can also email me throughout the show this evening, dave at darknessradio.com. If you have points or questions, I will try to weave them in throughout the interview. And then we have open phone lines, and I'd love to hear from you this evening. If you've had a creepy experience with something that your mind created, or a Slender Man experience, something along those lines, Black Eyed Kids, Slender Man, uh, the Men in Black, I want to know about it tonight. Phone lines will be open in the last two hours of the show. All right, let's get to the basis of this creature. Uh, Nick, is there any real thread of this archetype that, that goes back further? Because it seems like when we were looking into this to begin with, we were finding iterations of this that went back centuries in many different cultures and belief systems. Maybe not the shirt and tie Slender Man, but these long, lanky, faceless beings with spider-like legs seem to have been around for a long time. Yeah, there's actually several interesting um, angles to this particular aspect of the of the phenomenon. Um, one of them, um, which it gets into really weird aspects, um, actually relates to the same very same town where the girls initiated the attack. Um, for example, back in 1921, the body of a young boy was found in a pool in the city of Waukesha, um, only a few miles from where the, uh, the two girls launched the attack. And the, he was never identified, his body was never identified at all. And he became known um, by, the, by the local press at the time as Little Lawn Fultonroy, which is named after a story of this um, rich little boy. And the reason they gave him that name was because his clothes that he was wearing when he was found were very expensive. So the the theory was that, you know, he came from a rich family, although it was never proved. Now, what's particularly um, uh, very sort of odd and weird about this story is that um, a psychic actually looked at the at the case of, of, the, of the murder, and she said that she saw the image of this tall, thin man in a black suit carrying the body of the boy through the woods in Walkershire, just a couple of miles from where in 2014 the attack occurred. Now, Whoa. one of the people I interviewed uh, for my uh, Slenderman book um, was a guy named Mark, uh, Mike Huberty. And Mike um, told me how in the 1990s he and several friends were out in an area of woodland, again, just a couple of miles from where the attack occurred, and which had a, the area where they were had this sort of reputation of um, like a long-standing issue of mysteries and paranormal things going on in the woods. And Mike and two girls, when they were out there, they saw this tall, spindly, shadowy figure um, lurking in the woods, and they just fled the area. And, and again, in Walkershire, just a, you know, no distance at all from the, uh, from the attack in 2014. Now, of course, none of that made the, um, the court case or the police files or anything, and, and, and rightly so, because, you know, the courtroom isn't the place to debate, you know, the merits or otherwise of the paranormal. It's a totally different um, atmosphere and um, an area. But um, that's two uh, regional cases that predate the uh, slender man by significant times but there's another one that's which, um, crazy of, nick when that? when you're doing the research that's crazy when you come across that I mean, what what is your initial take on that now all of a sudden you're hearing that this creature uh, or a similar creature existed and that there are deaths and cr- kind of a crime associated with this mm-hmm. well yeah i mean the, the story is is a very weird one because the more you dig into it the more threads and leads you find that demonstrate that there's far more to this than's going on. I mean, you know, one of the reasons why the, the Slender Man may have come into um, reality, if you like, um, is because Eric Knudsen, when he created the Slender Man for the Internet, he actually was inspired by several 
um, paranormal entities in the real world, like the men in black, the Mothman phenomenon, um, <coughs> excuse me, and also, um, he was also inspired by the works, the fictional works of H.P. Lovecraft. Now, there's sort of a school of thought which believes that Lovecraft, when he created all these fantastic creatures like Yogg-Sothoth and Cthulhu and and all these ancient cities and things like this in his stories, there's a school of thought that thinks that he didn't actually create them from his, his, from his imagination, but that perhaps in, the, in, in his sleep state, in other words, in an altered state, he may well have astrally travelled and literally seen some of these places and unknowingly then kind of in, in, incorporated them into his story. So if you look at it from that perspective... Some people have theorized that perhaps Eric Knudsen, um, you know, he, he sort of tapped into a pre-existing archetype, a supernatural archetype, and unknowingly, you know, sort of um, turned it into a modern-day equivalent with the Slender Man because, you know, we can go back centuries, as you said, and find very similar cases. A famous one, um, which is the, the subject of a, a children's folk tale, fairy tale, is the story of the Pied Piper of Hamelin. Now, the Pied Piper of Hamelin, in the story, um, Hamelin, which is a little town in Germany, um, one day this um, mysterious character comes into town who's described as being tall, thin, and has a, an unusual appearance. And the, the town itself is infested with rats, and so the piper agrees uh, to get rid of the rats if the mayor will give him sort of a sub substantial payment of money. Uh, the mayor says he will, so the, the, uh, the Pied Piper plays this hypnotic pipe which causes all the rats to follow him to the river and they all drown. But the mayor goes back on his promise and won't pay the fee. So what he does when all the adults are in church one day, um, he gets in, comes into town again, plays the flute and hypnotizes all the children to follow him into the woods and ultimately into... Um, a mountain, which, if you read the story, it kind of sounds like a portal opens up and they all go through and the kids are never seen again. So here, you know, a very famous story. You have a, a slim or thin, tall, weird-looking character who has the ability to sort of enslave the minds or control the minds of children and takes them away into the woods and the mountains. You know, you, you can see easy parallels there with what's being talked about today with the slender man yeah no doubt there's uh see that was an interesting aspect of this i had never even considered or, or thought about before are there other characters like this and and i don't mean specifically the long slender guys you know with no face uh, and spidery legs but are there other architects like this that while you were doing this you started to uncover in your research as well well, yeah, I mean, in, in Germany, they have a very similar one called Der Grossmann. And, um, you know, that sort of, um, you know, a tall predatory entity, not unlike the Slender Man. Um, you know, you can find kind of similar ones in, in the world of fiction as well. I mean, um, you, you know, if you look at some of the, the stories, um, you know, vampire type stories, you know, you, you're looking again, sort of pale faced, ghoulish, skinny creatures that, that feed on people in the middle of the night and, you know, lurk in the darkness. Um, and I think, you know, just that angle of sort of the, you know, the black suit and the tie, um, you know, on the one hand, it sort of creates an air of authority, I guess, a little bit. But then when you add this sort of vacant face to it, you know, it becomes something more out of like some sort of gothic horror story, if you like. And I think... There is something to be said about sort of certain archetypes which come to mind in everybody's mind in some way or another. By that, I mean, you know, you could look at, find stories all around the world where, you know, kids, it doesn't matter what country you're in, kids fear what's underneath the bed or in the closet, you know, or you can find stories all around the world of a haunted bridge, you know, kind of, if you go to the bridge and knock on one of the the wooden post three times and turn around, you know, the witch will appear. There's variants on that kind of story everywhere. You know, they are ancient archetypes. And I think 
something like that could be going on with the Slender Man, that it's something primed in our subconscious almost, the, the image, and now and again, it gets a new lease on life. There's a lot of uh, speculation. There's a lot of people throwing out, you know, quantum physics this and thought process that and creation. Is there any real science to back up the ideas that we can create tulpas, that we can give life to these imaginations? No, the, that, that's the, the short answer is no. There, there is no hard and fast proof that um, thought forms, tulpas, uh, do exist or they can be created. But what I would say, you know, that there's a lot of highly credible um, testimony in support of that very scenario. I mean, you know, the, the Tulpa phen phenomenon, you can find a lot of well-known old stories going back decades. But for, for the, you know, for the listeners, I, I'll give you a really good one from relatively recent times. And um, it involves a well-known um, comic book um, author and artist from the UK uh, named Alan Moore. Now, Alan Moore was responsible for creating the Constantine character in the comic books, um, which was turned into a 2005 movie starring Keanu Reeves, and he also created the V for Vendetta character, which was also made into a hit movie. You know, so Alan Moore's got a lot of clout, you know, in Hollywood and in the world of comic books. Now, when Alan Moore was creating and visualizing the image of Constantine and how he was going to look, you know, his, how his hair would look, his face would look, his clothing, his mannerisms, his character, everything. You know, he put a lot of effort, um, you know, in, in his mind, so to speak, to see how he could create this image and, you know, make him a memorable one. And uh, he actually um, focused on Sting from the police. That was the image that he had in mind as how... Constantine should look um, and so as I said like like with people do with the Slender Man um, you know Alan Moore um, concentrated deeply on on how the character would look now it was during this period or shortly afterwards I should say that Alan Moore was having lunch at a restaurant in on the River Thames in London England and he's gone on record as saying that he, he saw literally the Constantine character walking right towards him with this, like striding towards him with this creepy, almost conspiratorial grin on his face. And Alan Moore was sort of frozen to the spot. You know, what should I do? Should I follow him? Well, he, you know, he just chose to stay there and the, and the uh, sort of the, the thought form of Constantine vanished. That's sort of a classic example of how this happens. You know, sometimes it can be achieved by mental concentration and deliberate, you know, a deliberate act. But on other occasions, it can occur without the person realizing or the people realizing what's going on. It's just the issue, um, the very issue of concentrating and in multiple groups can actually inadvertently create these things, even if you're actually not trying to create them. I know there was the Philip experiment, and are you familiar with that? Yes, I am, yeah. Now, in, in that experiment and with the follow-up on it, it did seem like there was something to the idea that by projecting an idea and an image, a thought process, that we could create something. We could breathe life into it, and it might take on a life of its own. But, you know, the question I've always thought then is, is it really something that has become its own being, or is it an opportunist spirit that says, well, if you want to communicate with somebody, if you want to talk to the ghost of Philip, I'll be Philip. Yeah. Right. And that's, again, buying into the fact that do ghosts exist. So there's so many different aspects of this that I find fascinating. Yeah, I mean, that's actually a good point. You know, some people do wonder if the, the thought form, when it's created, is kind of um, like a deceptive, dangerous, supernatural creature uh, masquerading as something else. You know, as some people think, you know, if you use Ouija boards, is it really your dead relative coming through or is it some sort of manipulative, supernatural, hostile creature which wants to get its claws into you? So there is that angle. But, I mean, the Philip one you bring up is a good one. For, for people who don't know, this was an experiment that occurred in Canada in the early 1970s with a paranormal group where they launched this experiment where they created this character called Philip. 
and gave him a background living in a sort of a, an old style manor house in England in the uh, sort of three or four hundred years ago. And they gave him a story of having a wife and he had an affair with a girl and she died. And, um, and it was a very sort of tragic story. And they built the story up and then they decided to try and contact Philip. And it was an experiment, to, you know, in, in thought forms. And according to the experiment, um, they got responses from Philip. And again, it was due to the concentration of the human mind that they absolutely created this thing as a fictional entity. But then, in the weirdest way possible, it started contacting them. In other words, something that never existed, really, was communing with the group. And so that, that, that's sort of another example of how that can happen. And although, as I said, there is no hard and fast proof of this, but there are, for me at least, enough credible cases to suggest that this can happen. I think that's exactly what's happened with the Slender Man, um, that we had the original fictional story, um, and we have people who are genuinely psychologically disturbed and believe it to be real. And then you have the third category, which is the thought form angle, where the creature now may be sort of self-aware, or they may be self-aware, depending on how many are created in, you know, during this, the thought form process. And now it wants to hang on to that lease of life that it's got, and essentially operates in the real world as it does in the stories, you know, being hostile uh, to people and, and highly dangerous. In the next segment, we'll be joined briefly by Bill Murphy from Sci-Fi's Fact or Faked to talk a little bit about Tulpas with us and, and an experiment that he did. And actually, this was part of our conversation that we had those many years ago, right before the Slender Man attack. And uh, he'll weigh in on, on some of those aspects as well. I, I, because I'm so fascinated by that process. And, you know, is there something there? Are we capable of creating? And I think what we consider the quote-unquote supernatural, Nick, in a lot of ways, we just don't give credit to just how powerful we are as beings and what we can influence, whether it's our own perceptions or broadcasting from us to others so that we have a shared experience. I don't know that there's necessarily dead people walking around us or that there are, you know, disembodied or, you know, discorporate souls. But I believe that there is probably a lot more to be said about the projection of our thoughts and our consciousness and the energy that surrounds us, the memories that we keep with us of people that we may be projecting into a place or the expectations that we may be projecting into a place. We'll discuss that and so much more. We've got a great night ahead of us here. And remember, open phone lines at the bottom of next hour for your questions, thoughts, and stories with Nick Redfern. And then the last two hours of the show, open phone lines. You can call in. We'll talk about any topic. I'd love to hear some of your creepiest paranormal and supernatural experiences it's your time to shine, so be a part of the show tonight on the best in overnight talk radio. I'm Dave Schrader, and this is Coast to Coast AM. The Slender Man Mysteries, an internet urban legend, comes to life. Nick Redfern, our guest. Now, Nick, as you uh, point out in, in the book, uh, when I did the show, I was speaking with a guest from Sci-Fi Channel's Fact or Faked uh, right here on Coast to Coast AM the night before or the night of the uh, Slender Man attacks in Wisconsin, um, we were talking about Tulpa's thought forms and talking about some of the experiments that have gone on uh, with Bill Murphy. And Bill is joining us online now as well. Bill, thanks for, for popping on for a little bit. Oh, it's my pleasure, Dave. And hello to you as well, Nick. Hey, Bill. How's it going? Things are good. Thank you for asking. All right. Now, I, I wanted to have uh, Bill pop on as well because, I, you know, I know you're always fascinated by the the experiments that are going on out there, Nick. And, and Bill, you've definitely been one of the people in the forefront uh, testing these theories on tulpas and what we can do. Where where are these creatures and beings coming from? Um, and you and I have talked about things like the little girl spirit on the Queen Mary, which we think, or at least I, I, I believe, is probably more likely a tulpa than it is a, a spirit of a little girl hanging out on, on a ship where there's no records of the death of any children let alone drowning children in the pool. 
Um, and, and that has led to an experiment that you've been doing. Do you want to give people a little bit of information on that? Sure. And, you know, both of you guys touched upon it earlier when you were speaking of the, the Philip experiment. So between some local haunts that you mentioned, Dave, and uh, locations that have ghost lore associated with them, but you can't find the, the really origin of the story, uh, the Philip experiment is one that has intrigued me for, for quite a long time, and I was interested in how Philip could have manifested in the physical space that Iris Owen and the rest of the Toronto Society of Psychical Research were in. Uh, it was behaving like a poltergeist. So it was knocking, you know, the table wrapping and, and knocking around. So how does that happen physically? So I looked like um, at, at really the methods that they used to create Philip. And just to elaborate a little bit on what Nick said, uh, it, it really had a, a tragic ending to Philip's story because, yes, Philip was um, an aristocrat, um, had a, a, a grand estate, but he was married uh, to you know, his wife, Dorothea, all fictitious, and uh, uh, Margot, the, um, the, the, the woman that he had an affair with, was then accused of being a witch and was burned at the stake. Philip then committed suicide by jumping off the wall of the estate. So now his ghost would haunt that location. So that was the storyline that they created, and then Philip started to reveal additional storylines when they would ask questions that they didn't write. And so it, he seemed to be like a tulpa, broke free of the creators and started to have was communicating independent with thought, his own thought, even though he was a, apparently a thought form. Well, Philip was abandoned, and when you listen to the the interviews with Iris and the rest of the team, they said that by abandoning Philip, because they felt the experiment had gone as far as it could, that even though he was created as a ghost, but then moved into the physical world and almost taking on a real life, by abandoning him, he then took on his intended role of becoming a ghost, where he remains, according to Iris's last interview. Well, all of that really intrigued me, and so what we did, and Dave, you happened to be present uh, when the experiment was done in 2007 at the Glen Tavern Inn, and uh, not every, anybody was really hardly aware of what we were doing, we being just six of us that created the history for Pearl, was the name of the ghost, at the Glen Tavern, but I wanted to have an equally tragic life and end for Pearl to attach an emotional component to her. So, you know, Pearl was a madam that was working in the brothel, and the brothel was real, but Pearl was not. And so we, we wove Pearl's history into the actual history of the Glen Tavern. And if you recall, in 2007, they had little plaques along the hallways and had tidbits of the history that were real, but one of the plaques was fictitious. It's the one that we wrote about Pearl. And so attendees, I, at least I was hoping, would be able to record sounds associated with Pearl that we wrote into her storyline, and those, uh, the sounds of the, the Pearl strands that she would spin and they would clack, and the coins that she would cascade into her hands and they would click together. And so if there were unusual sounds like that, then perhaps we could maybe make an association, or maybe not, depending on, on where these sounds were being recorded. Well, we did this. Um, some people became very critical of it, and Nick, you know, I think he sort of touched upon this. You know, we, by creating Pearl, we also created Pearl's murderer. And so the criticism I got was like, you didn't just create a, you know, a, a victim, a, a tulpa perhaps that would be a victim, but you created an evil entity as well, if, if all of this is even possible in the first place. Remember, this is all highly experimental. Now, I wanted to make this physical for those present to see if we could alter the space. And so, Dave, you may or may not remember uh, the photo that was taken or the, the, the black box itself, which is, um, really was created to bond everybody in the room. So we passed this little mechanism around. It was sealed. It had LEDs. It does have some moving parts and other components. But really, by passing it along, I was observing what was happening with it, and people were 
speaking to each other in a group. And normally if you have a big conference, a lot of people are there independently that are there, but it's not like a group conscious per se. And by passing this, this between everybody, some people would hold it to their cheek or to their chest because they could feel it moving. They would speak about it. And so I thought that this was perhaps joining the group as one, as Nick referred to as maybe creating a hive mind. And I had hoped that I could have gotten some results at the end of that conference. But I wasn't the organizer. Like you, Dave, I was invited to attend this conference. Uh, but what happened is that one of your conferences, Dave, um, in, at the Stanley Hotel, I was giving a presentation on spirit photography, particularly with the use of mirrors, when an attendee there at the conference approached me afterwards. And he said, you gave this talk on spirit photography with mirrors. I'd like to show you some photos. He went to his room, got a binder, started looking through it, and there's this photo of you know this double m- mirror, which is in the lobby of the Glen Tavern. I said, where was this photo taken? He says, uh, it's a hotel in California, the Glen Tavern Inn. I said, please, let's exchange numbers. I can't talk now, but I need to follow up. Well, I followed up, and the photo matches the description of Pearl. So I know you asked Nick earlier, is there any scientific proof or, that, you know, gets manifestation, is it, can it become physical or is this just a sort of a, a mental manifestation? Um, I would think that perhaps otherwise, that maybe these tulpas and thought forms can manifest. We got an image that can't be explained. I brought an LAPD forensic photographer to try to replicate the photo, and he could not replicate it. No matter how you staged that lobby, you cannot get a person to appear in the mirror and not be in, the, uh, in front of the camera. But in the photo, there is no one in the lobby. It's just the reflection in the mirror, and you see the, the cameras flash behind her. So... It's a mysterious photograph, matches the exact color, matches the images that we used, because like Philip, they drew Philip. We got images that we wanted Pearl to, to be representative of, and she was a conglomeration of stereotypes. And the image matches. So to answer your question directly, Dave, because, and that's a long answer, but you know, how do we do it? I, I actually broke it down into steps, and this was enabled by what Iris Owen and her team did. And really, if I could break it down just a a few quick steps, I'll just mention them right now, if it's okay. Please. All right. So we imagined the personality. That was step one. We wrote the history that surrounds this apparition. That was step two. We added the details, so like a a biography around the person to sort of bring the, the individual to life, so to speak. The fourth step was kind of critical. We wanted to compel the thought form to exist by affirming its existence through... It, it looked um, almost like a reverse seance, so it was a bit of a, a conjuring episode that took place, and not everybody is too keen to doing that, but that was what we did. But instead of conjuring an entity that you would then try to control, we were just trying to conjure a thought form into existence that had no prior history. Number five is attempt to communicate with this entity, and then six, record the results, and finally present the findings. So it wasn't until I I met Jim Spann, the photographer, that now we had a photograph that perhaps was the the end result of this creation of of Pearl. How does that affect you as somebody who's running an experiment like that, Bill, I mean, Nick, you're, we're talking about thought forms, the idea that these things may exist, and all of a sudden we've got somebody now who planted the seed of an experiment in 2007, and years later somebody's photographing a room where this creature, this being was created, and there's photographic proof of this being existing now. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, this is the sort of thing we need, um, going from just sort of discussing things from a theoretical perspective and actually you know, having some degree of um, reality and evidence to it, you know, to show um, that there is something going on. And I think, you know, you made a good point before the, the uh, break, Dave, when you actually said, you know, um, you know, terms like supernatural, etc. I think, you know, the time will come probably when 
if we do understand one day what thought forms actually are and how they come to be, but it'll probably be something that'll be explained, you know, by a, a form of science that, you know, we just don't know the answer to right now. You know, so it, it gets passed off as it's magic or it's the occult or it's the paranormal. But it may have a, you know, a rational answer that it, it just eludes our science, you know, in the early 21st century. And Bill, when you're setting the standard for this and you're, you're creating, and then all of a sudden photographic proof comes back of your creation, how does that impact you? Well, um, to sort of answer that and address what Nick said, I wanted to understand the, the mechanism. What is the physics behind this? How could an image appear as a reflection and not appear as a physical body in the room? Because, you know, the mirror is just bouncing photons back and it's reaching your eye and, you know, there you're, you're, you're perceiving the image, the light that's coming in, but there was no originating light for the, for the photograph. And so I, 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 I really started the research to dig into that, and I, I ran across a presentation, and eventually I became a student of uh, Dr. Claude Swanson, and is very interesting physicist. Um, he's got a series called Synchronized Universe, and in there he discusses, uh, one of his books is called Life Force, The Scientific Basis. He discusses how an entity and a ghost and, and this sort of physical manifestations could occur. And he, and he explains it with the fifth force of the universe. And, you know, there's the weak and the strong nuclear forces, there's electromagnetism, and there's gravity. And so this fifth force is torsion fields, which is the twisting action, and it distorts space and therefore light. And that's how these images could possibly be created through these torsion fields. Well, you know, you can, you can have a heavenly body. You can have the earth, you can have the moon, you can have stars. Uh, their twisting action will certainly have an effect on the surrounding area through these, these torsion fields. But I dug deeper into the Society of Scientific Exploration, the SSC, and there were other physicists that claimed that the human mind creates this twisting motion as well, and it could possibly bend light and move objects, which is psychokinesis. And I replicated the, I took the white paper for two of them and replicated everything. I mean, we spec'd it out using it, all the exact components to see if we could create pendulums that were mounted. These aren't little simple pendulums. These, these, are, these are big sort of industrial heavy pendulums. See if you could create um, a spinning action on them, and when everything is dampened, there's no seismic activity, no thermal flow, no wind flow. So I had to totally get a place that was completely isolated from the ground, uh, no wind, nothing. I had sensors everywhere, and there, there is no environmental factors that could explain what we were doing, but we would whoosh this pendulum to spin, and it's about, about the size of uh, maybe 14 inches across, it's got some weight to it, and you look at it, and you desire it to spin, and it begins to spin. And so we have cameras on it, and we're measuring the movement on it. And, and while the person is visualizing it moving, so you're not necessarily looking at it. You can look at it. You just have to think about it, and it would, it would move. So the physicist that discovered this discovered it by accident when he was staring at his birdcage, and it began to spin, and he... Why is that happening? So he's one of the first ones that created the experiment, and then other physicists then replicated his work and got the same results. I brought in some people from the SSE to see if we could recreate the experiment, and we got the same results. So it was, it's like unbelievable to talk about, but when you experience it and you see it happening, you see that psychokinesis, moving objects, perhaps moving photons of light, and them forming an image becomes more realistic it, so that, that sounds that sounds a lot like these uh um psychic developers that talk about cloud blasting where they'll go out and stare at the clouds and make like a gun with their finger and they'll point and shoot and blow clouds apart i mean it sounds like you're having that same kind of physical effect on a uh you know on, on an outside uh item you know i mean you've got it you've got it going on simply by the conscious decision to make it happen yes uh with the exception uh, of a major difference that if you're looking at 
you know, a cloud, and it's cloud busting is, the, is kind of the, the slang phrase for it. If you're doing cloud busting, then you don't have control over the environment because, you know, there's, there's thermal flow and there's breezes that's happening all the time. Uh, the moisture is accumulating and then breaking apart. So it's, if you stare at a cloud, it'll move and it'll, it'll become, you know, Mickey Mouse if you wanted to, um, or just blow holes in it. And so that will happen over time randomly, kind of like a, a lava lamp will just move in the shapes. But if you, if you remove all those other factors that could influence, say, a cloud, in this case, uh, we'll use the pendulum as the example, the platter, uh, and then you can still make it move, and it's mounted, and it's stationary, and there is no other, there's no environment that could interact with it, then there has to be this, another force that's causing it. And so that's why the only one that I am able to fall back on that has any sense of being rational is, is Claude Swanson's. Um, and it's not just his theory. He just writes about it in his book, Life Force. And so that's where I first became aware of it, and that's why uh, torsion fields are of interest to me, because it could explain what appears to be haunting in poltergeist activity, and perhaps the photograph that we spoke of with Pearl. Bill, thank you very much for calling in and being a part of the show with us. Nick Redfern's going to stick with us for the remainder of this hour. We're opening up phone lines. We'll take your calls. If you have thoughts on Tulpas, have you had your own experiences, what do you think about Slender Man? Is this being something that's now part of our world, or has it always existed? And now that we're giving it the attention that it wants, it's making itself known. We'll talk about that when we return here on the Best in Overnight Talk Radio. For George Norrie, I'm Dave Schrader, and this is Coast to Coast AM. Thank you very much for joining me. Hey, I'm going to be participating in a new TV series about people who've had experiences in hospitals, paranormal experiences. They're looking for more people to share their stories, doctors, nurses, patients, security workers, anybody who's experienced anything paranormal in an active hospital hospice uh, nursing home. If you have a story to share like that and you're interested, you can email your contact information and a short blurb about it to me at dave at darknessradio.com, dave at darknessradio.com, and I'll forward it over to the producers. If they're interested, they will get back to you, but you may be featured prominently on a new TV series about uh, hauntings and haunted hospitals. Again, you can shoot me your story and contact information to dave at darknessradio.com, and I'll make sure to pass it on to the production company. I'm going to be going out to Romania this year, and uh, we've done these live trips every year. We've had listeners from our show and Coast to Coast join us as we go out and hit the road uh, to see haunted historic sites around the world. This year, we're going to be visiting with uh, um, Romania. Following in the footsteps of Vlad the Impaler, we'll get a chance to investigate a few of the different castles, uh, paranormal investigations, haunted Baisu Forest, and more. You can find information on my website at darknessevents.com. That's darknessevents.com. Not only that event, but all the other great places that you can see me and my co-host Tim Dennis at throughout the rest of the year. We'll be back with Nick Redfern and your phone calls next here on Coast to Coast AM. We're back. Nick Redfern, my guest for the remainder of this hour. Nick, are you ready to throw open the phone lines? Yep, yep. All right, let's hit it. Wild card line one, Charles in Elgin, Texas. Welcome to the show. Yes, hello there, David. Boy, it's so good to hear the, the way you're talking about this uh, this sort of thing. Is that it, it does point to bigger issues, ones I hope that you'll, take, you'll uh, kind of be able to discuss uh, in the second half of the show with turn open lines. But, um you know, I mean, it seems like uh, here we are, we're kind of, um, you know, we're in a situation where we're being in a new reality where we, we're we kind of remembering, uh, you know, our power as, uh, or, or as creator. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, it seems like, you know, here we've got the Slender Man and all that. And sometimes I think we can also affect the past by, the, by our present, you know, by what we're doing in the present. So... The um, you know, like my my issue, uh, my question for I guess for Nick. I mean, Nick does a lot of things to make things real too. When he writes about something, or he he writes about whatever it might be. I don't know if he's written about time travel, but that's kind of my issue. I I want to make that more real um, in this reality that we're in. But the thing is, I, I wonder 
um, when he writes about Slender Man, or when anybody creates any of these characters or, or uh, you know, lets people know about these, these sort of potential realities, I wonder how much we're kind of creating um, uh, these, these realities that we, 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 we think we're... I mean, here's one, one important thing. All right. Well, hold on. One second. Do you have a Do you have an actual question for Nick? You said you had a question, and then it just so, keeps going. I want to make sure he can address yeah, it before sorry, our time yeah, slots. No problem. Yeah, yeah. I've got. I, I do have a question. I mean, how how much do you think? Uh, let's see. One of the, okay. Uh, science. Uh, science is sort of the game of uh, you know uh, working things out, figuring stuff out. And when people, well, of course, once you figured out everything, then the game's over. But so that'll never be over. Uh, you know, the fun of it will never be over. But so I wonder how much, you know, all these efforts to, to prove things by science, like, you know, uh, the effects of tulpas and all that. I mean, how, um, you know, have you done, have you done any kind of, does your writing include any kind of, uh, you know, any kind of uh, acknowledgement of, of the of the fact that we, you know, we're, we're sort of um, we're increasingly able to create these realities. And um, well, that's a, actually a good question because you know, if if the human mind can sort of focus on something like a a slender man and create it, whether it's one person or multiple people, then you know, you could make a good case that if somebody reads a book and becomes, you know, really deeply interested in the character of one particular story, and they spend a lot of time afterwards thinking about that particular chapter or that character, then arguably, um, you know, you could achieve something very similar. You know, there's not much, if you think about it, there's not much difference between obsessing on an image of the Slender Man, you know, on your laptop versus reading about something in a book, in that sense, you know, I mean, you you could kind of suggest that just the just the, the the act of thinking about something that is in a book could potentially tip the scales and and start off the creation of a of some sort of thought form. So, um, you know, there's as we heard with Bill, you know, um, a totally uh, you know a different way as well of sort of bringing these things into being and the, with the Philip experiments and things like that. So I think whether it's a book, whether it's a movie, you know, a comic book, whatever it is, I think it's, that's less important than the process of actually creating these things. But, you know, if you've got an image in your mind from a book or a TV show or whatever, um, you know, that, that would strengthen, I think, the belief and the ability to to create a real-world version of it. Thank you very much for calling in. Here's an interesting email, and I, I think they mistook your point on this, so I want to give it a chance to be okay. voiced and, and have you uh, kind of answer to this. It says, The girls that attempted to murder their friend because of Slenderman had serious mental health issues. For your guest, uh, you or your guest to suggest anything else is beyond disrespectful to the girl that was stabbed. The girls who perpetrated this senseless crime are sick, sick with diagnosable serious mental health conditions that require medications to regulate. For your guests to suggest this crime had anything to do with anything under uh, other than the two sick girls with an undiagnosed mental health condition is wrong. Those girls, because of their health, were susceptible and vulnerable to fictitious things they read or saw. If it wasn't Slender Man, it would have been Mickey Mouse or a voice they heard telling them to hurt somebody or themselves. That's the way mental illness works. Um, well, I think I think she's misinterpreting what you were saying and what well, we were talking about. We were discussing why black-eyed kids phenomena uh, and Slender Man didn't really kind of go the same way. And we said, well, one was because it was being taken more literally and people were we're taking this creation and suddenly treating it as though it were real and that there's no question. These girls have a mental issue and that they are desperately in need of medical uh, help for this. And we in no way want to diminish the victim's uh, anguish that she had to go through on this. We were simply, at least I, I was bringing up the fact that the way that some of these creatures are, are perceived by the mainstream and by, you know, people in the, in the paranormal community is 
you know, maybe the reason Slenderman got so much more attention is because it leapt to the actual news pages um, because of stories like that. But yeah, I mean, if people go back and listen to the archive of this tomorrow, they'll they'll see that when I was, I was talking about that, I actually did say that some people take the view that this is purely an internal psychological thing on their part, you know, and other people, people, I was being truthful when I said people, there are people who do believe that the attack by the girls did have a supernatural component. There are people who believe that. That's what I said. Um, now, one of the reasons why some people do believe that is because, as I pointed out, there have been uh, reports of um, tall, slender, dark figures in that area um, on previous occasions, one of them being, as I mentioned, uh, one of the guys in the book, Mike Huberty. Um, he had a, an experience in the 1990s. Um, so, you know, that is one of the reasons why people, um, or some people, look at this particular angle of the, the girls and the attack from a different perspective than it just being, you know, something to do with a, you know, with a mental illness or whatever. Um, some people legitimately do think, with the, the other strange stuff going on around Walkershire, that it, it isn't the full story. Now, you know, I mean... There's no, like, as you said, Dave. You know, there's no doubt that um, you know the the court came to a decision, and as I said, they'll be a, a behind you know out of society for, for decades. Um, and there's no doubt that they fully believed in you know what they were what they were looking into in terms of the of the slender man. But as I said, yes, there are two um, schools of thought, totally different. One that it is due to mental illness, what, and the other one is the idea that it was, you know, it was connected with something else. I mean, bear in mind that um, one of the girl's mothers did say that she, that her daughter had seen something like the Slender Man years earlier. That's not me putting words in anybody's mouth. That that actually came from one of the mothers. So, you know, in, in other words, that's why, for some people, there is a grey area. For other people, there's no grey area, and it is just mental illness. All right, let's go to uh, first-time caller Adam in Johnson City, Tennessee. Welcome to the show. What did you want to share with us? Hey, thanks, David, for having me on the show. Um, what I was... Um, I just started a job a couple of weeks ago where um, it's a third shift job where the majority of my job, I'm actually driving in a car at about, um, I mean, just going from about two or three in the morning. Um, I remember I was having trouble staying awake and um, I was sitting there trying to think I was praying and everything. I was like, God, I got to stay awake. Please like send something to keep me awake. And I remember this um, gray face and all I remember was the face and it was like a gray figure. And it had black eyes and like a black um, like divot where the mouth should be. I didn't see any kind of eyes or anything, but I just remember it passed through me. And I woke up instantly, and um, I was awake for the rest of the night. I just couldn't even think about going to sleep after that. Where, and how, how long ago was this? Um, this was about um, probably about two weeks ago. Well, that's freaky. So you've seen a similar character to this Slender Man. And see, I've, and, I've never even heard of the face described right. before until the night when I was listening to the show. And that face, I mean, when I heard him describing that face, I mean, I just had to call because that was the, almost the exact kind of description that I saw. It's interesting because my kind of first uh, connection to this faceless creature came from uh, a personal friend who had a car accident driving and uh, she and her husband got to an intersection, and they saw this car come creeping through the intersection in front of them. It was a T, and and the person driving behind the wheel turned to face them, and it was just this blank, flat face. You know, there was no eyes, no mouth. It just turned to look at them. Later on that evening, when they got back to that intersection, they were T-boned by a truck that had gone out of control. Um, and so, I mean, there's some of these weird aspects of it as well. Now, have you heard stories like this, Nick? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, a classic example of, um, you know, this phenomenon, sort of the, you know, the the face that actually isn't really a face, so to speak. Um, but again, you know, it, what this demonstrates is that 
people are seeing something that very, very closely resembles a fictional creature, the Slender Man. Um, Thank you, Adam. Again, whether people, you know, accept these accounts or not, the fact is they are out there, you know, and, I, and I've got a lot right. of them. Um, and I don't personally think that, you know, um, like, for example, right now, you know, with, with your caller, um, things like that are hard to deny, you know, when you've got somebody rationally and lucidly telling a story of something happened that happened to them. And, you know, it, image-wise, it, uh, it, you know, it ties up very closely with the Slender Man. And um, so, again, you know, whichever way people look at it, there's a phenomenon. That there's no doubt about that. And that's, you know, when the, the well, not the last caller, but the person who left the message, um, you know, that, that demonstrates the whole issue of the Slender Man. Is it this or is it that? Or is it somewhere hazily between the two? You know, and um, and that's not a case of me, you know, having my cake and eat it, so to speak. You know, right. as I said, there are people who have one view on it and other people who have another on it. My view is the, um, you know, the thought form angle. And, I, you know, I, I think it has merit to it. And the more that it gets discussed and talked about, the more it becomes in the public domain and it goes on and on and on. Let's go to Wildcard Line 3, David in Flint, Michigan. What point did you want to bring to us? Hello. Um, thanks for taking my call. Uh, nice to meet you, Mr. Schrader, and you as well, Mr. Redfern. Thanks. Thank uh, you. Uh, my uh, is an experience um, goes back oh, to about 1977, 1978, um, in a town about 12 miles from where I live. They were having some sightings of what was supposedly a Bigfoot. Well, as the local sheriff and the law enforcement found it was a man wearing a Halloween gorilla suit. And it was easily debunked, but the people were still, after this was highly published, that this was a man in a gorilla suit, the people were still seeing dark, hairy forms in the woods. There was um, one rumor of someone actually shooting at what they thought was a creature and one getting into someone's garbage. And years later, I went to college and studied psychology and was thinking about uh, studying Carl Jung and the collective unconsciousness, and I was wondering if I got to thinking of, did this phenomena, was it started to link in everybody's minds to create either hallucinations or archetypes that people believe that they were seeing something that might have been there or not, and then in reading Mr. Redfern's book on the Slender Men and Tulpas, I was kind of, it struck me in the same form that maybe it wasn't a single person that created this, but a group of people in an area were able to form something that caused these people to see something like this. Well, thank you for weighing in on that, David, um, and we appreciate the call. Nick, I'll let you wrap up with that as we have about a minute, minute and a half left together in this segment. Well, one of the interesting things about uh, what the caller just said is the fact that, you know, uh, somebody running around in an ape suit. I actually do have a, a couple of cases, not in relation to uh, to Bigfoot, but actually to, to other uh, types of creatures where people have, we know somebody has fabricated something, somebody's absolutely hoaxed something, and but in the immediate weeks afterwards, people claim to have seen something identical to the original hoax, you know, the original created hoax, as if you know, in the in the period in between when the hoax was carried out and in between the period when it was shown to be a hoax when everybody was sort of, you know, running around town and trying to find out what this monster was, in that period, everybody really was focusing on it. And even though, you know, it was kind of shown to be a hoax, um, people reported something pretty much just like the hoax. 
again, as if, you know, just the act of planting the seed in people's minds that there's a monster out there, um, you know, that, that might explain some of these very weird Bigfoot-type reports where people claim that the creatures vanish before them. You know, they, can ne they never end up getting shot and killed. And, and, of course, the skeptics say, well, that's because they don't really exist. But on the other hand, you know, you could make the argument, what if because people um, believe there are strange things in the woods that it gets kind of embedded in our subconscious and, you know, we, we believe or uh, to, to some sub subconscious level that there are monsters in the woods or in the lakes. And so we create them, but we, never, we can never catch them because... They're not really flesh and blood animals. They're sort of born out of the mind. Interesting stuff. The Slenderman Mysteries, an internet urban legend comes to life. Nick Redfern, our guest. Thank you for being with us. Stay tuned. We're taking your calls next. It's open phone lines. Let's hear your creepiest tales and experiences next on Coast to Coast AM.